So we have reached the end of two very exciting days. At least I was uh, thrilled and I learned a lot. And it was uh, the company of uh, a lot of intellects really uh, uh, going through the two days. Uh, my task at the end of a conference, I always do that, is try to do a little uh, fast, of course, summary of what we've gone through, just to um, recapitulate a little bit, but I will not take uh, a long time. I always think it's uh, gratifying to see how much we've gone through together. So we started with the speech of Frank, come hell or high water, addressing the risk of climate, environmental and related litigation for the banking sector. Now, um, I had the impression that for many, this was new, a lot of people did not realize how important this topic is, and I think it was a good idea of him to bring it here. So he offered an insightful overview of the rising importance of the climate-related litigation, and I encourage you to look into the report he was uh, indicating, based on the findings uh, of this uh, NGFS report. He noted um, also how the climate-related obligation stemming from the Paris Agreement uh, are trickling down from the level of nation states to the private parties. And uh, this includes corporates, but also goes back uh, to banks. And they, banks, are not immune from these developments, and climate litigation is becoming more and more a risk that um, uh, this puts in danger the soundness of banks. And therefore, he was saying banks should have an, more ambitious and realistic plans to control and reduce their exposure to their risk, and symmetrically ask supervisors um, to uh, take care that banks take the necessary action. He also said another thing. He said that he cannot exclude that uh, certain rules are already considered to be existing by courts that will be soon be um, uh, asked to pronounce. So duties of banks to also uh, implement the Paris agenda. We move then to... Um, very, in my view, interesting topic as well, the preliminary references and how this instrument has been um, a unifying element for uh, European law, but also uh, what came out in the very challenging first presentation was uh, that uh, um, uh, uh, it was a challenge to the legitimacy of the supremacy principle. This supremacy principle, of course, underlines the relationship between the Court of Justice and the National Courts in the implementation uh, of all these procedures and in this particular case. And um, the argument was made that there would not be a legitimation by people because this is not written in the treaty. That view was opposed. Uh, um, I also personally think differently, but I think it is always very refreshing to have these issues uh, raised, of course. Um, one important point that I liked was that uh, the remark that the um, uh, referral is a tool that has empowered lower courts to go straight to the ECJ without the filter of the higher courts. Whether the higher court likes it is another matter. But uh, the question that was raised is whether this has perhaps also over empower them because the traditional the national courts uh, then feel more like you courts than as national court and sometimes are in a uh, difficult or perhaps um, uh, attractive position to have to choose between the European pronouncement and the national pronouncement. And that could be politically, at least or sociopolitically, uh, an issue or an, uh, an, an interesting uh, topic. The, um, this controversial position brought to a very animated discussion. We, we all participated, and several members also of the panel uh, passionately intervened to defend the supremacy of your law and the legitimacy. And what was indicated was, uh, or reminded, was the very existence of the Declaration Number no. 17, which is attached to the Lisbon Treaty, the legal service opinion, but also the reference to Article 14 of the Treaty of the, uh, on the Function of the Union that speaks of equality of member states, equality that you can never achieve unless um, you have a single interpretation, because otherwise uh, there is different treatment in different member states. Uh, also, it was mentioned for more than half a century this principle has not been contested. Um, now, that particular panel, I heard someone telling me that there were voices, probably from uh, the central banking lawyers, I suppose, that this was very academic. But we noted online that this was the peak of the attendance. So the average attendance of a whole conference was 100 people online, but here there were 269, just uh, for you to be, to be aware. So I come to panel two. 
maybe the panelists of the first panel are still around, so they yeah, can be <laughs> happy about that. The panel two was on independence, accountability, proportionality in the context of the secondary mandate. Also, this was opened by a controversial th uh, thesis. Alexander Thiel uh, had to leave a little bit early, but he was mentioned several times over the two days um, because um, uh, he uh, introduced the idea of the political legitimacy necessary in order to uh, apply uh, or to implement the uh, secondary objective and in which way to do it by reference to um, perhaps a recommendation. Um, he also argued about the double standard of independence that one could imagine to apply. That also provoked some debate. Uh, some people were not excluding it, others were quite uh, provoked by it. Um, and then among the various points uh, raised, it was also observed that it would be a little bit difficult to uh, distinguish the functions in which a central bank was acting sometimes, and so then to decide which type of independence is it admissible that there is an interference from the government, yes or no. Um, the idea was also to give back the decision to the political fear, uh, a decision which would be allegedly political in nature, but then you might run the risk to, monitor, to politicize monetary policy decisions as well. Yeah? Of course, I cannot address all the points because, you know, I just wanted to bring some points that um, somehow, um, you know, uh, remained in my mind. We had then the keynote speech of uh, Professor Stefan uh, Hubbard on the protection of fundamental rights in the European multi-level system. I found that this speech was a very nice um, balance um, between showing how the courts work well together and showing how they actually disagree. <laughs> Explaining that disagreement is actually okay, provided it is not contest, constant. It's probably quite, uh, from a practical point of view, a good approach, but uh, I, I just noticed this. It was uh, anyway very nice that, um, uh, first of all, that he came and then that he spoke to us uh, about fundamental principles that, as lawyers, are for us anyway really uh, the basic for our all our work uh, in the end. But he also mentioned, and you all heard that, that the Constitutional Court of Germany was the first one to recognize the supremacy also on constitutional law. However, they cut the borderline between constitutional law and European law in a, a way that others have then criticized in the in the group. Um, he finally concluded that hierarchy is maybe not the best uh, criterion or principle to describe the relationship between the courts. And this we know is uh, the question of pluralism or the question of hierarchy is a very, a very important, very debated one. So we come to today, well, I spared the dinner yesterday. I hope you had a nice uh, chat and nice conversations. Uh, I had the impression. In the third panel, the first of uh, this morning, the uh, question of the illegal war launch by Russia against Ukraine was in a way underlying all the discussion about the uh, central bank uh, immunities and the sanctions uh, at, you know, uh, on central banks uh, or, or on the um, uh, foreign reserves of central banks. Then we uh, had the pleasure to hear the US experience, which I uh, found described in a very uh, clear way because it's a complex uh, system. But um, um, it also, uh, the discussion also clarify that there is not a super, super clarity between uh, on the two concepts of state, what is a state and a central bank, what is central bank, uh, which type of... So all these are um, areas in which there is always a borderline or a, a grey border that of course allows us and allowed us this morning to have very nice conversation. Um, let me move to panel four. Um, this uh, filling the gap, central banks, competent authority, legislative uh, frameworks. Um, it was focusing on the classification and practical developments relating to ECB opinion. Uh, it was found that um, the opinions actually carry more weight and influence on legislation the closer the matter is to the competence of the ECB. Um, there was also a proposal to look at um, opinions as a form of soft law instruments filling the gaps in legislation, which in turn raised questions as to opportunity to differentiate between those cases where the ECB is called to enforce the law and those cases where the ECB is one of uh, those uh, on which the ECB is in a way enforced. Uh, and then the accountability and justiciability of ECB opinion were considered. 
uh, taking as a means of comparison the case law uh, on the lack of uh, procedural requirements. I come to the fifth panel, which is uh, in which uh, the incorporation of environmental consideration, the supervision of prudential task was dealt with. This is basically um, the Article 11 of the treaty that was uh, analyzed. Uh, the looming question was whether the climate change should be framed under the secondary objective uh, or rather under the primary objective. Um, I personally question whether this is a good uh, discussion for supervision as um, we are in a different realm. But in any event, the inclusion and uh, the incorporation of environmental considerations are uh, also for the supervisory uh, part. The question here is always price stability and financial uh, stability um, are the two aspects in which uh, all these considerations come also into, um, into consideration. The uh, interesting element was the time dimension. Uh, it has been observed that uh, in the discussion that um, the prudential measures that support the fight against climate change, so the brown penalizing factor, for example, one should not see a trade-off between the price stability and financial stability on the one side and the environmental protection on the other, but rather between the appropriateness to intervene in the short term or having to intervene later, but much more massively, uh, to manage a situation that will be much more complicated for banks. And also the proportionality principle was identified as the device to settle this kind uh, of trade-offs. Um, the last panel, uh, me, sorry, <laughs> because I could not yet print it, um, but you all uh, have heard it was dealing with the monetary um, uh, sovereignty. This concept was explored from different perspectives. Uh, on the one hand, from the one of a small state whose biggest concern is the currency substitution. This can happen easily when you have a case of a hyperinflation or a, in a situation in which the state uh, somehow allows or even guarantees another currency or gives legal tender to a cryptocurrency. Um, Another perspective was the one on a, of a monetary union, so the story a little bit of the EU, um, EMU was, was um, uh, reminded, in which the states have transferred the um, sovereign competences to the central bank, to the European Central Bank. The criticism was made that that central bank perhaps has made a too restrained use of that sovereignty, looking more inside than outside, and only very recently the um, uh, the interest in putting the euro into the international uh, monetary system again has been revived, so to say. And the third uh, perspective was the one of the development of the central bank digital currency by some central banks. Um, and the question was asked whether the reason, the very reason is maybe maintaining the monetary uh, sovereignty. Um, that was uh, the final panel, and I think it is a very, very interesting topic that uh, will still have to be explored. The monetary, the central bank digital currency, as you know, is still in study, so there will be further development. And uh, the geopolitical situation is such that this question will not uh, leave us. So we've reached the end of our uh, conference. Um, I introduced the conference yesterday, if you remember, wishing to all of us, uh, candid discussions, provocative questions, spirited debate. I think we had that, and I think we can be happy, and uh, um, we uh, really created an open exchange uh, that uh, we were aiming, aiming at. Thank you to all the participants. Thank you to all the speakers in particular, because they have put a lot of energy into this. Uh, thank you for the team that in the background really has um, make it, made it possible for the, all this to happen. There are so many details, so many things to check, etc. I cannot name the whole group, uh, but I would like to name one person. That is uh, Antonio Rizzo, who is uh, the coordinator, the one that has been behind every step and every, um, every problem to be solved. And uh, together with the rest of the team uh, has made this uh, possible. So thank you very much. Maybe we can clap for them. And also our photographer, of course. <laughs> so we have reached the end. Let us conclude the conference.
I wish you uh, a nice trip back, and I especially wish you not to forget this in three hours, but to continue the nice relationship, the contacts you had, the ideas that have started here, at least until next year, when I hope we will meet again. Thank you very much.